Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the conversation series. I am thrilled today to have Sean Holmes, founder of Nectar Sunglasses, uh, based out of Sh Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm excited to have him here and to share this incredibly cool brand um, that he's created. And uh, he's going to walk us through all of it, but I'm going to turn it over to him and let him introduce himself. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you uh, reaching out and having me on the show. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned, live in Charleston, South Carolina. We're based here on James Island. So right between downtown and, and the beach, which is where we want to be. Um, Surfing is a big part of my life and, and kind of the foundation of the brand at, at the very beginning. So yeah, just had our first baby my wife and I so getting used to the non-sleep uh yeah months old so it's been a crazy transition but super exciting very cool congratulations to the both of you I want to hop right in get into the creation story behind Nectar Sunglasses where how you got it started all of it yeah prior to ne Nectar's foundation I was in school at VCU in Richmond Virginia playing baseball and like anybody who gets recruited in a scholarship you think you're going to be a pro and tail end of my career or there, I realized that that was not really feasible. You have to be really good and um, just didn't want that lifestyle of driving a bus in the minors and getting paid nothing. And um, met an entrepreneur and got an opportunity, really kind of begged him for an opportunity to, to learn from him. He was doing squeeze page kind of affiliate marketing. And I just knew there was power in the internet. So he offered, if I moved to Atlanta, he would teach me whatever he knew. And I, I dropped out and, and, uh, moved down there and had a, one of my best friends at the time, they were in the Marines together. So him and I moved down and wanted to learn together, started a business that didn't quite work out. It wasn't a passion by any means, yeah. but I was in Atlanta looking for a way to like, all right, I need to redeem myself. Yeah. But I did learn so much from that experience of like, all right, I know how to do this. I just, you know, he was kind of needed that structure and entrepreneurs don't yeah. need to thrive in that environment yeah. of not having structure. Yeah. Um, so which was fine. Uh, I don't think it would have worked out in the long run anyways, but um, while in Atlanta, one of my buddies I grew up with surfing and skating and snowboarding was into that as well, entrepreneurship. And we decided to like start a business, but I did basically said like, I, we need this to be a passion of ours. Like what I picked first was an experience, but it wasn't something I'm really into. And um, the idea was like, Hey, what, is a lifestyle that we want to live. Like, I think being a pro surfer, getting to travel around the world and surf the best waves is like something that we envied. Like, let's make a product that embodies that. And at that time, there wasn't a ton of eyewear at a, at a lower price point as an option. There was kind of the typical Ray-Ban, Luxottica brands that are $150, $300 pairs of glasses where, you know, it shouldn't be a burden to wear a nice pair of shades. It should be an asset to your outfit or your adventure. And, um, so we picked sunglasses as a way to go in and, and really kind of started off as like a, a party shade. We were just at a college, 23, 24 years old, and um, it's evolved quite a bit from there, but yeah. initially kind of founded off of like even the name we were looking at the products, like, what are you, what is this? Like trying yeah. to come up with a name for it yeah. because I knew that was a very important piece and, and it went from Latin stuff to made up words and yeah. um, ultimately we were like, these are fucking sweet. Like, and then nectar kind of came from that. Um, even initially, we thought it was a little bit weak sounding and maybe yeah. not the best, yeah. but it, it turned out to be great. And um, yeah, so it started in Atlanta, Georgia, in a tiny apartment and used to build every pair by hand. So that's crazy. The, the by hand part, when I was reading about nectar and the starting story, like the by hand part was the part that I was like, holy shit. I'm like, that's crazy. But I guess what you were talking about, like that's entrepreneurship. Like that is the process of starting out and doing it yourself and doing everything yourself and getting to the point where you can bring on more people. But it's, that's a, that's a fantastic example of entrepreneurship right there. Yeah. It's amazing to think where we're at today in terms of logistics and yeah. fulfillment to where back then it was, uh, the, the reason we we're building them at the time was we offered a custom page where somebody could make red lenses with one white arm and a black right. arm and blue front. And the reality was no one was really, really using that. And it really messed up inventory because we'd be out of black arms and only have the front pieces. And we couldn't make our standard pair black on black, which is the best seller. Um, and it just became a nightmare. And, and 
was not really uh, scalable <laughs> at that rate. Understandable. Um, you pointed out Ray-Ban, you guys are a lower price point. Outside of price point, what makes Nectar stand out when you're looking at, like you said, Ray-Bans, Oakley, all of these other big sunglass brands and even smaller sunglass brands that are out there today? Sure. I think, you know, it's a challenge for, for when you have these companies like Luxottica, Essilor that own a vast majority of this industry that um, have all the data, they have all the stores and, and things that they need to make on the fly decisions. But I think at the end of the day, they don't have that touch with their customer, like a smaller business can do. And, and when in eyewear, there's really only a handful of materials that you can use to make sunglasses or frames from. So it's, you know, the differentiation factor to me always comes back to how strong is the brand, how how strong is your community that you're building around the lifestyle and values that you embody and and, and hope to find the people that find those same values in it to yeah. become customers for life. Because, you know, if the brand's there, the price is irrelevant. And, and obviously we don't have this higher price point. It did start at 20 bucks, yeah. um, but that was way back in the day. And I think where we landed today, around 49 to 69 in that average, you know, I believe that we're offering the best value and quality that you can possibly buy at this, at yeah. that price point. And, and that's what I try to focus on is making sure that at the end of the day, they need to perform the, the lenses need to work really, really well. And uh, average customer can't tell the difference between the clarity in our lenses, which is one step below glass to yeah. a coast Del Mar. That's $300 that has a glass yeah. lens. Um, so the brand for me has always been a big focal point to try to like really treat our customers super well. I think that goes a lot further than people think of, yeah. you no, know, we're just not, they're not a number in a retail shop. Like we really care about them and want to make sure that um, everyone's treated the same way and that we appreciate them. St talking about how you guys made your glasses, you know, you're repurposing single use plastics. Can you go into the purpose, first of all, of why you guys started doing that and then uh, what that process is of using those plastics to create the sunglasses that you guys have. Yeah. So like I was talking about just the differences in materials is pretty yeah. tough. And it's, you know, this industry is mainly using just normal plastic and it's not reusable. It's not recycled. And I was on a trip, a surf trip and actually got to experience seeing like a reef that was fully white capped and, and hearing the locals say that 15 years ago it was vibrant and full and just, hit me to my core of just yeah. thinking, man, we are producing plastic all the time. And, and what can I do that's going to help leave less of a footprint? And are there options? And and I just spent months trying to dig through like ocean plastics. What does that refinement look like and sourcing? Yeah. Um, you know, we ended up landing on a, instead of just using water bottles alone, which ended up having a product that felt really, really light. Like we, our products are lightweight and intentionally lightweight to not feel heavy on your face and be able to be worn for an extended period of time. But there is a perception with quality when people feel something and, and yeah. it just felt a little bit too brittle. Um, so we were looking for different solutions and found a plastic that actually mixes bottle caps, um, water bottles and food containers. So like a thicker, heavier, denser plastic. And that actual blend gives a really nice aesthetic to what was matching our prior product. And that was a big proponent of like, what I was looking for while simultaneously making sure that this is recycled the right way. And we source and have partners that do the refinement and washing and, and get it into that pellet form that we can actually use at the right temperature to inject them into our, our glasses. There's so much science behind all of that too, like the plastics, like it's so fascinating to me, just how that whole process works, how you can take the plastics, what we have in water bottles and all this stuff that we use in daily life and get it to, sunglasses for you guys or whether it's shoes or something else um but it's such an interesting process and i'm glad that we are starting to use and do more of that to your point our ocean is filled with it how can we get it out how can we use it smarter and in all these different ways um but I, so i'm so glad you guys are one of those companies that does reuse that plastic um, and uses it in a smart way I want to get into the creation process of all of Nectar sunglasses from, you know, the frame design to the lens, to how you guys come up with the really cool names you guys have for each of your sunglasses, starting from 
beginning to the brainstorm of it all, what does that look like in terms of creating a, a brand new pair of Nectar sunglasses? So it is a pretty a long process to, to say the least, and a lot of things go into that. Um, you know, typically we look for inspiration and in things that, you know, whether it's a coastal living, how can this benefit the experiences on the, on the coast or in the mountains? And, and, you know, we're positioned as more of like an act, everyday active lifestyle. We're not really into mountain biking specifically or, or running specifically. We're really trying to make products that fit people's lifestyles that like to go on weekend trips and go to music events and go on the beach and the boat. Uh, and those are the things that we love doing. So we always kind of look for products, one that we're lacking, those are a shape that we're seeing trending that we need to try to create something similar to that, that we can do in our own way. Um, and it will typically start from drawings and inspiration from drawings. And we take that to a 3D molding process. And um, one is just cheaper before we actually make the tooling for it. We're able to test several different times. Typically we'll go through four to 10 different molds that we will tweak a little bit. We'll get dozens of people to come in and try them on if we know we're making them for a certain face shape or activity like on boating for example like it's they're pretty specific about blocking all the light that comes through and they don't want to see this or it's touching their cheekbones too much or how it's sitting on their nose so there all those little elements um eyewear is a very intimate of a purchase right like we'll do events and seeing people walk up and put them on their nose for one second and go, no, these aren't it. It's like, well, you didn't even look in the mirror. Like you don't, you look good, but that's how intimate this is and why it is a challenge, you know, for especially e-commerce to like let people try them on. If they don't like them, like they can return them super easily because if it doesn't feel good, you're not going to wear it. And that's really important. Um, so once we go through that 3d molding process, then we'll take that to tooling and then actual color sampling and, um, early days of nectar, there was a lot of vibrant, loud colors. And yeah. I had a guy one time tell me like, look around, like how many cars are yellow? I was like, you know what? Right. <laughs> These aren't everyday things. And, and yellow shades might be worn once at an eighties party or something. So my goal is one to make them fit super well for the lenses to perform really, really well. Obviously the frame now having this impact is, is beneficial, but ultimately like not chasing trends too far because you know, they can become dead inventory if you miss that. And that's not who we are in terms of a fashion company. Yeah. We really focus on like them being more of an asset to what you're doing and for the lens to truly enhance that experience and be a part of that ride and, and journey with you yeah. um, because it is important for your eye health and, and yeah. same time, like things do look better and it's less eye strain and, and glare. So that goes into like the making of them. And it does take about three to six months to really get physical samples, depending on like the pace of a, what we're going at. Um, and the whole naming system, uh, we went through a repositioning, if you will, um, three years ago and and really looking for a way to take our brand and, 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 and give it more of an identity because at the early days, there was a lot of trying to be everything to everybody. We were working with people from all over the country, photographers from different countries. Yes, they were giving us cool content, but it wasn't necessarily relatable to where we were selling the most, which is where we grew up on the East Coast. And, you know, I don't know anybody who's been to Tahiti, really, maybe a couple people. Like, how is this kid that wants to take photos in Tahiti? Like, really, you know, we tried to focus more in our backyard and, and take care of this side of the coast. And part of that branding repositioning was like, we are an East Coast brand. This is where we grew up. This is where we live and what we love. And we built this country like we should be proud of that and a lot of this industry is kind of out west and has this california dreamy lifestyle but like for us internally it's like fuck that we have mountains and oceans and rivers too like sun still sets over here and there's a lot of like really unique things that we try to highlight on the east coast and you know even from accents you know you talk for someone from boston to new york to philly to georgia it is dramatically different and the nuances of how they talk and treat each other um, build this character that we're trying to embody. And that goes into the naming system of the glasses where we want to, you know, take our favorite parts of the, the East Coast and, and put them on a pedestal because we love that area. But I, I love that whole process. Uh, and it's so interesting to hear because I think we just think things are made with a snap of our fingers and we're like, oh yeah, here we go. Um, we immediately can have it. And I will also say from a sunglass wearing person, 24 seven, uh, once you find that good pair of sunglasses that like you were saying, like you put on and it fits your face, right? 
you sometimes don't even realize you're wearing sunglasses half the time. Like it's just, it feels like it's a part of your face. Uh, sometimes people will look at me and be like, you know, it's cloudy outside. I'm like, nope, didn't even realize I had my sunglasses on still. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're going for is, is finding people like you that, that it fits. And we can only offer so many different styles and shapes. Um, so we obviously look at a lot of data and see what sells and, and try to keep it as close to that as possible because we know that, that those work and, and don't stretch it a ton, but make sure again, like just they fit super well and, and work. Outside of y'all's website, because I know that's a big uh, e-commerce web uh, place for you guys, but where can people find Nectar sunglasses? Yeah, obviously the online is going to have the biggest selection, but we do sell with um, about 250 different retail partners from Maine to Florida, a few out West, but mainly surf outdoor apparel shops. Um, so typically you'll find us at, at beach stores like that. From an entrepreneur's perspective, just looking to pick your mind on a piece of advice you would give somebody who's, you know, every, it's kind of the time that everybody's going out and creating their own thing or doing their own thing. What is just a piece of advice you would offer someone uh, that's looking to get started doing their own thing? Probably a lot, a lot of stuff, but I, I think <laughs> the, um, there's a lot that I take to like the mentality of entrepreneurship. Obviously, it's not for everybody. And, and um, just having the ability to to take a moment before reacting and, and try to figure out how to turn that into an opportunity. I think a lot of people take things and it's a, the easy way is flipping that switch down to a negative mentality and saying, you know what, uh, we're done. This isn't going to work, but there's, there's always a way to figure things out or flip those into opportunities. And I think as an entrepreneur, you need to have that ability to kind of steady the ship and, and, and not make these knee jerk reactions because um, we've had some crazy scenarios that have happened where, Yes, I go into a couple of days of a slump, but I, I have to really dig myself back up and say, you know what, this is an opportunity. And it's made me reach out to people I never would have reached out to. It's made me go down avenues I never would have thought to go down. And, and it always becomes something that makes you stronger and better. And um, just learning to kind of roll with the punches because it's never going to be easy. There's going to be factors that happen that are outside of your control. And typically with like myself, when I rely on so many variables to get somebody a pair of glasses, um, you know, you can only control what you can and, and, and knowing that, you know, from a customer standpoint, like the other advice that I give is just like the communication is so crucial that when I started the company, I worked at a restaurant part-time and, and would do orders during the day. And it was just this never ending thing, but you learn how people, how to treat people and talk to different types of humans. And just an example of like why people send an email when their orders confirmed, it's, if I would see somebody start like doing this killer whale move at a table looking for a server, yeah. that's not good because they've been sitting there too long. If you literally just walked up and said, hey, I just got three tables at once. I'm going to get their drinks and I'll come right back and get you. They're going to be like, this dude's cool. We're good. But yeah. it's like that little gap in communication, which might be two minutes, is, is really critical in setting the experience for the entire rest of their journey with your brand or product is like that communication is, is so valuable. I don't know about you. Um, one thing I do love about the entrepreneurship environment uh, is whether it's good or bad, there's no day that's the same. Uh, you're always on your toes, in which I have an appreciation for because I've been in environments uh, in the corporate world and just other experiences where I'm like, I am bored out of my mind. But when I'm in spaces like this and working with clients, I'm like, I feel energized. I feel like I am the creation process and all of that. Uh, it kind of keeps you energized. And like I said, whether it's a good or bad day, um, I'd rather have those days than just be bored out of my mind. Yeah, it's. Uh, I love the fact that, you know, I just like finding solutions and navigating situations and, and every day is different. Uh, like you said, I'll come in for one goal and not get that done because 10 other things came up and you know, that's just part of it. Um, but I like to adapt and evolve and, and continue to try to find solutions for things to, to continue to get better. I think it goes back to like being playing baseball my entire life and practicing one thing and knowing that these little tweaks make a big difference. And, and that's what it is. It's, you know, at any point, if I had stopped swinging one summer, I'd lose my swing and you're yeah. like behind again. So like, you can't stop working on your craft and and that's all this is, is just continuously effort to like refine and tweak and refine and tweak and keep getting better. Um, 
so it's never ending. Percent, hundred percent. Starting out, you know, you building glasses in your your apartment in Atlanta to now having a team of people. Like, what is important from you from a founder's perspective of building your team? Who are you looking for? What is kind of the personality you're looking to bring on to your team? Yeah, I mean, I think anybody hiring it is a challenge. People are hard. Business fundamentally is not that hard, but people that have emotions and needs and expectations and, and um, it's hard to find the right people. And, and I look for people that do have some sort of entrepreneur or kind of mentality where like, hey, like I would rather you get it as far as you can before coming to me than just ask me how to do something. And, and I've learned that you can't teach work ethic. Like people either have it or they don't. Um, in the environment that we're in now, there's a lot of younger kids, if you will, that that they just don't have that in, innate work ethic, which is um, it is what it is. They just don't have it. So you got to find uh, the people that do that. And then from like a cultural standpoint, like I, I look not to find the same people I want to find. What is our culture lacking and what can we add that's going to add value? And like some of our teams surf, they don't all have to love to surf, but that is, you know, our policies. If there's waves, we go do it and we work after. And I want them to make sure they enjoy their lifestyle and, you know, it, it all kind of varies from business to business, but I think finding the right people that have work ethic that can, that want to grow is um, really what I, I look for. And I want to, to me, it's more of like a mentorship than a boss. I, you know, I, I know that they have it in them, but a lot of times maybe in the corporate world, which I've never really experienced, but I, I, I would rather invest in them long-term and know that, Hey, when you leave, I'd rather you learn things here and, and set yourself up for success for whatever else you do. And, and hope to put you in situations that you feel a little bit maybe out of your league, but that's a good place to be in when you're having to solve these things and, and push yourself rather than being in a complacent, you know, boring job. Um, yeah. so that's my goal with our employees is to continuously push them and, and make sure I listen to them as well. I think it's important that I know what's going on a little bit in their life because there are factors that come into your work productivity that you might not want to talk about. And, and I think that goes back to communication of, Hey, like if you want more time at home, like I'm not a mind reader, if we need to have that conversation or if you want more money, like I'm not going to give you more money. Like let's figure out a way that we can make you more money. And so um, I just find that if employees start festering things a little bit too long, that's when negative stuff starts creeping into the environment and the culture. And I try to solve that by continuously just, getting coffee with them once a month or doing lunch or something to like take it away from work and like yeah. they're like are you good and yeah, yeah. So that, that that's a big part of our our family here love it and i think that goes back to the piece of advice you just came gave to like that open communication you're not a mind reader at all you got to be able to tell that so you got to be able to tell have them be able to tell you what is going on uh i think that's extremely important and i love that you know when serves on see ya <laughs> yeah our team like i tell them like i can handle bad news what i can't handle is no news like if you don't tell me we can't find a solution for this like it just gets worse and business has told me like you can't hide anything it's going to come back around it's going to pop up it's like you can push it off but the reality is we're going to face this thing at one moment so let's just hit it head on and get past it and and obviously it's probably easier said than done if something bad happens but uh you know, I've had an employee that was like, oh, I thought this was going to be 300 and it was $3,000. I don't know, like just weird things. It's like, well, yeah. you could have told me that that bill was coming through and yeah. it's not the biggest deal, but I'm sure it was a big deal to tell me that you messed up. My last question for you, Sean, is just what inspires you? Um, I think deep down, like I, I just internally want to view myself as successful in, in, in what I'm doing and impacting people and whether it's employees or customers and um, even on the, you know, like I mentioned, like some of those hard days, like I'll have to go read reviews and be like, Oh shit. All right. I'm doing, people love this. Like yeah, yeah. You know, bring myself back up. But at the end of the day, I want to make sure that I, I, I get fulfillment from knowing that I'm creating something and growing something and creating a livelihood for other, other people and, and creating an awesome product and brand that, that resonates with people. That's what inspires me to keep going. Bad reviews, never a good thing to look at either. I'm always like, I don't want to go look at the comments. It's just awful world in the comments sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
You can be good though if you find find the good ones. <laughs> they might give you some good feedback. Uh, there may be some good things to learn in there. Uh, but Sean, I can't thank you enough for joining me today and walking me through Nectar and uh, y'all's history and what you guys continue to do every single day. So I appreciate it so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah, absolutely. Sean's socials are going to be linked down below. So is Nectar. So please go give them a follow. Um, but I will see you guys back here next time. Bye, y'all. Thank you.